My father was a king and the son of kings. He was a short man, built like a bull, all shoulders. He married my mother when she was 14 and sworn by the priestess to be fruitful. He did not find out until the wedding that she was simple. When I was delivered, a boy, he plucked me from her arms and handed me to a nurse. In pity, the midwife gave my mother a pillow to hold instead of me. My mother hugged it. She did not seem to notice a change had been made. Quickly, I became a disappointment. Small, slight, I was not fast, I was not strong. The best that could be said of me was that I was not sickly. I am five when it is my father's turn to host the games. I remember the runners best, nut-brown bodies slicked with oil, stretching on the track beneath the sun. My eye catches on a light head among dozens of dark, tousled crowns. I lean forward to see, hair lit like honey in the sun, the circlet of a prince. When the priest strikes the ground, he moves easily, his heels flashing pink as licking tongues. He wins. I stare as my father lifts the garlands and crowns him. The leaves seem almost black against the brightness of his hair. His father, Peleus, comes to claim him, smiling and proud. My own father turns to me. That is what a son should be. Beyond this, I remember little more than scattered images from my life then. I was summoned to the king one time. I remember hating this, the long walk up the endless throne room. King Tyndarius's daughter is finally ready for marriage, he said. I knew the name. Tyndarius was king of Sparta and held huge tracts of the ripest southern lands, the kind my father coveted. I had heard of his daughter, too, rumoured to be the fairest woman in our countries. My father cleared his throat. We would do well to have her in our family. You will go and put yourself forth as suitor. I knew better than to speak my discomfort. My father already knew all that I might say. That I was nine, unsightly, unpromising, uninterested. We were not the first suitors to arrive at Tyndarius's citadel. I heard the great hall before I saw it, the clatter of goblets and armour. There was violence in that room, with so many princes and heroes and kings competing for a single prize, but we knew how to ape civilization. One by one they introduced themselves, these young men, showing off shining hair and neat waists. Tyndarius greeted each in turn, accepted their gifts, invited each to speak, and present his suit. Menelaus, seated beside his hulking, bear-like brother Agamemnon, gave a beautifully dyed cloth. Though the lady needs no adornment, he added, smiling. I wish I had something as clever to say. I was the only one here under twenty, and I was not descended from a god. Perhaps Peleus's blond-haired son would be equal to this, I thought, but his father had kept him at home. Welcome, Menoetius. The speaking of my father's name startled me. Tyndarius was looking at us. It is my son who comes today to wed your daughter. Your son is not yet a man. Tyndarius's voice seemed far away. He need not be. I am man enough for both of us. It was the sort of jest that our people loved, bold and boasting, but no one laughed. I see, said Tyndarius. Others have brought bronze and wine, oil and wood. I bring gold, and it is only a small portion of my stores. We're grateful that you've brought us such a worthy gift, though paltry to you. A murmur from the kings. There was humiliation here that my father did not seem to understand. I would make Helen the queen of my palace, for my wife, as you know well, is not fit to rule. I thought the suitor was your son. I looked up at the new voice, a man who had not spoken yet. He had a jagged scar on one leg, a seam that stitched his dark brown flesh from heel to knee. My father was angry. 
Odysseus, son of Laertes, I do not remember inviting you to speak. The man smiled. I was not invited. I speak only as an observer. What does he mean? My father was frowning. If he's not here for Helen, then for what? Tyndarius was also mild. If your son is to be a suitor, then let him present himself. Even I knew it was my turn to speak. I am Patroclus, son of Menoetius. My voice sounded high and scratchy with disuse. I am here as a suitor for Helen. I had no more to say. I stood and carried a bowl to the pile of gifts. I knew how I must look to these men. Oblivious, the line of suitors moved on. At last it was the man with the scar's turn. Well, Odysseus, son of Laertes, what does a disinterested observer have to say to these proceedings? The man leaned back. I would like to know how you're going to stop the losers from declaring war on you or on Helen's lucky new husband. I see half a dozen men here ready to leap at each other's throats. My father stiffened beside me. His was not the only angry face in the hall. Now I offer you a solution. I believe that we should let Helen choose. Odysseus paused to allow for the murmurs of disbelief. Women did not have a say in such things. No one may fault you, then. And before she chooses, every man here must swear an oath to uphold Helen's choice and to defend her husband against all who would take her from him. I felt the unrest in the room. An oath? And over such an unconventional matter as a woman choosing her husband? Very well. Tyndarius, his face unreadable, turned to the veiled women. Helen, do you accept this proposal? From behind her veil, her voice came low and lovely. I do. Tyndarius nodded. Then I decree that it is so. All those who wish to swear will do so, now. I heard muttering, a few half-angry voices, but no man left. One by one the priest summoned us to the hearth, marking our wrists with blood and ash. I chanted the words of the oath back to him, my arm lifted for all to see. When the last man had returned to his place, Tyndarius rose. Choose now, my daughter. Menelaus, she spoke without hesitation, startling us all. So be it. My father's hand seized my shoulder, pulling me angrily off the bench. We are finished here. He would never mention the trip again. And once home, the events twisted strangely into my memory, like something a bard had spun, rather than something I had lived. I stood in the field. In my hands were two pairs of dice. They were carved from ivory, smooth under my thumb. It was late summer and I was panting. Since the day of the races, I had been appointed a man to train me in all our athletic arts, but I had escaped him. Then the boy appeared. He was the son of a nobleman who was often at the palace. Older, larger and unpleasantly fleshy, he leered at me, held out his hand. Let me see them. No, I did not want his fingers on them, grubby and thick. I was small. I was rumoured to be simple. If he backed down, it would be a dishonour. I stepped back. He smirked then. Coward. I am no coward. Your father thinks you are. His words were deliberate, as if he were savouring them. I heard him say so. He did not. But I knew he had. The boy stepped closer. He lifted a fist. Are you calling me a liar? I knew that he would hit me now. I planted my hands on his chest and shoved as hard as I could. His head thudded dully against stone and I saw the surprised pop of his eyes. The ground around him began to bleed. I had not seen the death of a human before. The rattle of it. The choke and scrabble. I fled. 
The boy's family demanded immediate exile or death. They were powerful, and this was their eldest son. My father would not risk losing his kingdom over such a son as me. So he agreed. I would be exiled and fostered in another man's kingdom. In exchange for my weight in gold, they would rear me to manhood. This was how I came to be ten and an orphan. This is how I came to Fethia. Tiny, gemstone-sized Fethia was set in a northern crook of land between the ridges of Mount Othrys and the sea. Its king, Peleus, was one of those men whom the gods love, not divine himself, but clever, brave, handsome. As a reward, our divinities offered him a sea nymph for a wife. Divine blood purified our muddy race, bred heroes from dust and clay, and this goddess, Thetis, brought a greater promise still. The fates had foretold that her son would far surpass his father. Peleus's line would be assured. But, like all the gods' gifts, there was an edge to it. The goddess herself was unwilling. The gods forced her to swear that she would stay with her mortal husband for at least a year, and she served her time on earth as the duty it was, silent, unresponsive, and sullen. Her reluctant womb bore only a single child. The hour her sentence was finished, Thetis dived back into the sea. I was led through the palace by a servant. I guessed that I was being led to the throne room, but the servant stopped suddenly at a side door. King Peleus was absent, he told me, so I would present myself before his son instead. I was unnerved. Peleus' son. I could still remember the dark wreath against his bright hair, the way his pink soles had flashed along the track. That is what a son should be. I took another step forward, scuffing my feet. In the five years since I had seen him, he had outgrown his babyish roundness. I gaped at the cold shock of his beauty. Deep green eyes, features fine as a girl's. I had not changed so much, nor so well. He yawned, his eyes heavy-lidded. What's your name? Patroclus? It was the name my father had given me hopefully but injudiciously, and it tasted of bitterness on my tongue. Honour of the father, it meant. I waited for him to make a joke out of it, some jape about my disgrace. He did not. A stray lock of gold fell half into his eyes. My name is Achilles. We regarded each other. Then he blinked and yawned again, his mouth cracked wide as a cat's. Welcome to Fethia. I was not the only fosterling in Peleus's halls. The modest king turned out to be rich in cast-off sons. My bed was a pallet in a long barrack-style room filled with other boys tussling and lounging. For meals, we sat at tables scratched from years of clattering plates. They trained us with sword and spear. This was the price of Peleus's kindness. One day we would make him a fine army. At night, I dreamed of the dead boy his head cracked open like an egg. Across the dining hall, I caught the flash of bright hair in lamplight. Achilles sat with a group of boys who crowded him like dogs in their eagerness, mouths lolling. That is what a prince should be. In the fourth week, the boys learned at last of the reason for my exile. Their whispers choked me, turned the food in my mouth to ash. My narrow world narrowed further. I heard you were here, a clear voice, like ice-melted streams. 
Achilles. I was in a storeroom, my knees against my chest. I have been looking for you, he said, his face serious. I have come to see if you are ill. No, I answered, dully. Then something shifted in his face, a decision. Come, he said, to my lyre lesson. We walked in silence through winding halls and came to a small room. Achilles opened a chest. He pulled a lyre from it, plucked a string. The note was warm and resonant, sweetly pure. I swallowed, my throat dry. It is beautiful. Achilles returned to his strings, and the music rose again. It was like no music I'd ever heard before. It had warmth as fire does. When at last he ceased, it took me a long moment before I came back to myself. Patroclus. Achilles rang each syllable. Tonight you're to sleep in my room, he said. I was so shocked that my mouth would have hung open. All right, I said. A servant will bring your things. I could imagine the thoughts of the other boys. Why him? He had bestowed the long-awaited honour upon the most unlikely of us, small and ungrateful and probably cursed. Slowly, though, I grew used to it. After dinner, my feet took me to his room out of habit, and I thought of the pallet where I lay as mine. After a time, I found I could sleep again. The dreams lessened and dropped away. He began to tell me the stories of his day before we drifted off to sleep. After a time, my tongue loosened. I began to tell my own stories. I'm glad your father sent you he said. I stopped watching for ridicule, the scorpion's tail hidden in his words. He said what he meant. Our friendship came at once after that, like spring floods from the mountains. One day we might go swimming, another we might climb trees. I did not mind any more that I lost when we raced and I lost when we swam out to the rocks. It was enough to watch him win, to see the soles of his feet flashing as they kicked up sand, or the rise and fall of his shoulders as he pulled through the salt. It was enough. The only place I did not follow was to see his mother. He went late at night, or at dawn, and returned flushed and smelling of the sea. One morning of my second spring, he came back from his visit with his mother later than usual. Is she well? She is well. She wants to meet you. Do you think I should? I knew her reputation for hating mortals. He did not meet my eyes. There's no harm in it. Tomorrow night, she said. I understood now that it was a command. The gods did not make requests. The next night, when the household slept, I climbed out of our window. The moon was half full, bright enough for me to pick my way over the rocks without a torch. A breeze blew down the beach, and grateful I closed my eyes to it. When I opened them again, she was standing before me. She was taller than I was, taller than any woman I'd ever seen. Her black hair was loose down her back, and her skin shone luminous and impossibly pale, as if it drank light from the moon. You are Patroclus. I flinched at the sound of her voice, hoarse and rasping. I had expected chimes, not the grinding of rocks in the surf. Yes, lady. Distaste ran over her face. He will be a god, she said. Do you understand? I could feel her breath on my cheek, not warm at all, but chilled like the depths of the sea. Yes, she leaned closer, looming over me. Good. Carelessly, as if to herself, she added, You will be dead soon enough. She turned and dived into the sea, leaving no ripples behind her. You will be dead soon enough. She had said it coldly as a fact, and she wished him to be a god, a god 
Her desire was ambitious. It was a difficult thing to make even a half-god immortal. What are you thinking about? It was Achilles come to find me. I'd half expected him to come. I'd wanted him to. Nothing, I said. It was untrue. I guess it always is. He sat down beside me, his feet bare and dusty. Did she tell you that you would die soon? I turned to look at him. Yes, I said. I'm sorry, he said. The wind blew the grey leaves above us. She wants you to be a god, I told him. I know. His face twisted with embarrassment, and in spite of itself my heart lightened. It was such a boyish response, and so human. But the question still waited to be asked. Do you want to be? I paused, struggling. Do you want to be a god? His eyes were dark in the half-light. I don't know, he said at last. I don't know what it means, or how it happens. He looked down at his hands, clasping his knees. I don't want to leave here. When would it happen anyway? Soon? I knew nothing of how gods were made. And is there really a place like that? Olympus? She doesn't even know how she'll do it. She thinks that if I become famous enough, he trailed off. Then the gods will take you voluntarily. He nodded, but he'd not answered my question. Achilles. He turned to me, his eyes filled with a sort of angry bewilderment. He was barely twelve. Do you want to be a god? Not yet, he said. A tightness I had not known was there, eased a little. I would not lose him yet. He cupped a hand against his chin. His features looked finer than usual, like carved marble. I'd like to be a hero, though. I think I could do it. If the prophecy is true. If there's a war. My mother says I am better even than Heracles was. I did not know if it was motherly bias or fact. I did not care. Not yet. He was silent a moment. I stood, put down a hand for him. He took it, pulled himself up. There were figs in the kitchen. I saw them, he said. We were only twelve, too young to brood. I bet I can eat more than you. Race you. We ran. The next summer we turned thirteen. Our bodies began to stretch, pulling at our joints. The other boys, too, were growing older. Regularly we heard moans behind closed doors. It would have been easy, infinitely easy, for Achilles or I to have bedded one of the serving girls ourselves. Once I even heard Peleus offer the prettiest girl to his son. He answered almost diffidently, I'm tired tonight. Later, as we walked back to our room, he avoided my eyes. On one of the first fine days we're on the beach after lunch, our backs to a sloping piece of driftwood. Beside me Achilles shifts and his foot falls open against mine. He turns and finds me looking at him. What? he says. Nothing. I can smell him. The oils that he uses on his feet, pomegranate and sandalwood, the salt of clean sweat. He puts a hand down to lean against. The muscles in his arms curve softly, appearing and disappearing as he moves. His eyes are deep green on mine. My pulse jumps for no reason I can name. He has looked at me a thousand, thousand times, but there is something different in this gaze, an intensity I do not know. He watches me. It seems that he is waiting. I shift an infinitesimal movement towards him. It is like the leap from a waterfall. I do not know until then what I am going to do. I lean forward and our lips land clumsily on each other. 
They are like the fat bodies of bees, soft and round and giddy with pollen. I can taste his mouth, hot and sweet with honey from dessert. My stomach trembles, and a warm drop of pleasure spreads beneath my skin. More. The strength of my desire, the speed with which it flowers, shocks me. I flinch and startle back from him. His eyes are wide with surprise. What have I done? He stands and steps backwards. His face has closed over, impenetrable and distant, freezing the explanations in my mouth. He turns and races, the fastest boy in the world, up the beach and away. My side is cold with his absence. Dear gods, I think, let him not hate me. I should have known better than to call upon the gods. When I turned the corner onto the garden path, Thetis was there. Her fingers, chill and unearthly pale, reached for me. My feet knocked against each other as she lifted me from the earth. I have seen, she hissed the sound of waves breaking on stone. I could not speak. She held me by the throat. He is leaving. Her eyes were black now, dark as sea-wet rocks and as jagged. I should have sent him long ago. Do not try to follow. She opened her hand and released me, boneless, to the ground. By breakfast, everyone knew he was gone. I walked north to where the palace road divided one half twisted northwards towards Mount Pelion and Achilles. I glanced back at the palace. Now, it must be now. I ran. Hours passed. My muscles grew weak. The sun was well across the zenith now. And then, the barest sound. There was a movement from the woods and I jerked my head towards it. Too late. Something, someone, struck me from behind. Patroclus! Achilles was looking down at me. I hoped that you would come, he said. Is the boy hurt? A deep voice spoke from behind us both. I could see only the legs of the man's horse. I would have screamed then if my throat had not closed over with fear. The horse's muscular legs ended in flesh, the equally muscular torso of a man. I stared. Beside me, Achilles bowed his head. Master Centaur, he said, I'm sorry for the delay. I had to wait for my companion. This is Patroclus. My lord, I said and bowed. I am not a lord. I am a centaur and teacher of men. My name is Chiron. It is a long way to my home on Pelion. You will ride on my back. We nodded quickly. His back was broad and lightly sheened with sweat. There was no path that I could see, but we were rising swiftly upwards through the trees. Chiron stopped suddenly, and I jerked forward into Achilles' back. We are here. In front of us was a cave, but to call it that is to demean it, for it was not made of dark stone, but pale rose quartz. Come the centaur said. The next day we joined Chiron for his chores, collecting berries, catching fish for dinner, setting quail snares, the beginning of our studies. When goats that wandered the ridges took ill, we learned how to mix purgatives for their bad stomachs. When I fell down a ravine, we learned how to set splints, clean wounds, and what herbs to give against infection. 
Every evening and every morning we helped with meals, churning the thick goat's milk for yogurt and cheese, gutting fish. At night we lay on the soft grass in front of the cave, and Chiron showed us the constellations. Time passed quickly on Mount Pelion, days slipping by in idyll. One morning I woke to find Chiron gone. This was not unusual. I left the cave so that Achilles might sleep, and sat to wait for Chiron in the clearing. The strangeness began as a prickling of my skin. The leaves stilled, and the breeze died. I turned. Thetis stood at the edge of the clearing. My breath died in my throat. You were not to be here, she said, the scrape of jagged rocks against a ship's hull. I'm sorry, I managed. I warned you. She said. The black of her eyes seemed to seep into me, fill my throat to choking. A noise behind me, and then Chiron's voice loud in the quiet. You are frightening the boy, he said. He does not belong here, she said. Chiron's hand landed firmly on my shoulder. Patroclus, he said, you will return to the cave now. I stood unsteadily and obeyed. I did not worry any longer for myself. Chiron meant to keep me, but there was something else less easy to name, a loss or lessening that I feared her presence might bring. Winter came, and the river froze. It was not long after the grass began to grow that Achilles asked Chiron if he would teach us to fight. He took us to a clearing, high on a ridge. He asked us each to perform the drills that we knew. Chiron was silent, standing in front of us. Well, what do you think? Achilles was eager. There is nothing I can teach you, said the centaur. You know all that Heracles knew, and more. You are the greatest warrior of your generation, and all the generations before. Men will hear of your skill, and they will wish for you to fight their wars, he paused. What will you answer? I do not know, Achilles said. That is an answer for now. It will not be good enough later, Chiron said. And that was the end of our lessons in soldiery. Two years passed. We were almost sixteen. Soon a marriage would be arranged for Achilles, and I might take a wife, if I wished to. I remembered the snatches of conversation I had overheard from the boys back in Phthia, the talk of breasts and hips and coupling. But other images came in their stead, the curve of a neck bent, hair gleaming in firelight, hands with their flickering tendons. One evening we stayed late beside the fire's embers, Achilles had been gone for much of the afternoon. Thetis had come and kept him longer than usual. Achilles rose and bade Chiron good night. I stretched, soaked up a few more moments of firelight, and followed. Inside the cave, Achilles was already in bed, his face damp from a wash at the spring. He said, You didn't ask me about my mother's visit. I said, How is she? She's well. Good. Achilles spoke again. She says she cannot see us here. Hmm? She cannot see us here. On Pelion. There was something in his voice, a strain. I turned to him. What do you mean? His eyes studied the ceiling. I asked her if she watches us here. His voice was high. She says she does not. I wish to tell you because... He paused. I thought you would wish to know. She... He hesitated again. She was not pleased that I asked her. I felt dizzy, my mind turning and turning through his words. She cannot see us. I realised that I was standing half frozen by the water basin, the towel still raised to my chin. I forced myself to move to the bed. There was a wildness in me of hope and terror. I lay down on bedding, 
already warm from his skin. Are you pleased with her answer? I said, finally. Yes, he said. We lay there a moment, in that strained and living silence. Then I turned to look at him. He leaned forward, our mouths opened under each other, and the warmth of his sweetened throat poured into mine. I could not think, could not do anything but drink him in, each breath as it came, the soft movements of his lips. I was trembling, afraid to put him to flight. I did not know what to do, what he would like. I kissed his neck, the span of his chest, and tasted the salt. His hand slipped over the quickened rise and fall of my belly's breathing. He stroked me gently, as though smoothing finest cloth, and my hips lifted to his touch. A hoarse cry leapt from my throat, and the sharp flowering drove me arching against him. He shuddered, and we lay still. Are you sorry? The words were quickly out of him, a single breath. I am not, I said. I am not either. There was silence again. A certainty rose in me, lodged in my throat. I will never leave him. It will be this, always, for as long as he will let me. The next morning I awoke light-headed, my body woozy with warmth and ease. We ate, then ran to the river to wash. We were like gods at the dawning of the world. Name one hero who was happy, he said. I considered. You can't. They never let you be famous and happy. He lifted an eyebrow. I am going to be the first. Because you're the reason. Swear it. I swear it. I feel like I could eat the world raw. A trumpet blew, somewhere on the slopes beneath us. It was abrupt and ragged, as if sounding in warning. Then a voice bawled up the mountain. I am here for Prince Achilles. Your father summons you. There is urgent business. At home. The great dining hall was crammed full of tables and benches. Servants hurried by with platters of food or lugged mixing bowls brimming with wine. And there, sudden as a lightning strike, stood Thetis. Peleus rose. I have received word from Mycenae there has been a crime. He paused as if he were weighing what he would say. The wife of Menelaus, Queen Helen, has been abducted from the palace in Sparta. Menelaus welcomed an embassy sent from King Priam of Troy. At its head was Priam's son, the Prince Paris, and it is he who is responsible. He stole the Queen of Sparta from her bedchamber while the king slept. A rumble of outrage. Agamemnon and Mycenae appeal to the men of Hellas to sail to Priam for her rescue. Troy is rich and will be easily taken, they say. All who fight will come home wealthy and renowned. This was well worded. Wealth and reputation were the things our people had always killed for. They have asked me to send a delegation of men from Phthia, and I have agreed. Who will lead it? someone shouted. That is not yet determined, Peleus said, but I saw his eyes flicker to Achilles. No, I thought, not yet. Across from me, Thetis's face was cool and still, her eyes distant. She knew this was coming, I realized. I understood, suddenly, the weight of Chiron's words. War was what the world would say Achilles was born for that his hands and swift feet were fashioned for this alone, the cracking of Troy's mighty walls. There is more. Peleus lifted a piece of linen, dark with dense markings. 
Before Helen's betrothal to King Menelaus, she had many suitors. It seems these suitors swore an oath to protect her, whosoever might win her hand. Agamemnon and Menelaus now charge these men to fulfill their oath and bring her back to her rightful husband. I stared. An oath. In my mind, the sudden image of Tyndareus's rich hall, filled with towering men. I sat frozen, afraid to move lest I gave myself away. I am bound to this war. Achilles' room was as we had left it, except for the pallet, which had been removed. We reached for each other. Later, Achilles pressed close for a final drowsy whisper. If you have to go, you know I will go with you. There were steps carved into the rock, coiling up the palace, and I took them. I went to the door and entered. Well, asked a guard. I'm here to see King Lycomedes, I said. Come, said another of the guards. I followed. In here. I stepped through the doorway. Inside, seated before the remains of a fire, sat a young woman. I am Princess Daedemeyer, she announced. I'm looking for a friend, I said. A young man from Phthia. Something flashed in her eyes. I will have to think on it. You will stay for dinner. If you are lucky, I may even dance for you. When the sun set, I returned to the hall. A group of women entered. Dedemeyer claimed one of the taller ones as her partner. The music began. I was impressed. The dancers tossed their heads as they whirled like high-spirited horses. The music trilled to an end. Dedemeyer led the women forward to receive our praise. Her partner stood beside her. She curtsied with the rest and looked up. I made some sort of sound, the breath jumping in my throat. Several things happened at once then. Achilles, for it was Achilles, dropped Dedemeyer's hand and flung himself joyously at me. Dedemeyer screamed. King Lycomedes stood. Achilles and I clutched each other, almost incoherent with relief. My mother... He whispered, My mother, she... Out! ordered the king. The rest of the court, both men and women, obeyed reluctantly. Thetis stood in the doorway. Her face glowed, the white blue of the flame's centre. Even Dedemeyer dropped into silence. We stood there a moment, facing her. Then Achilles reached up and tore the veil from his hair. He seized the neckline of his dress and ripped it down the front, exposing his chest beneath. No more, mother, he said. He turned to Lycomedes. My mother and I have deceived you. I am the Prince Achilles, son of Peleus. She did not wish me to go to war and hid me here as one of your foster daughters. Lycomedes swallowed and did not speak. We will leave now, Achilles said gently. No, Dedemeyer said, voice rising. You cannot. We are married. Lycomedes' breath rasped loudly. Is this true? he asked. It is, the goddess answered. You are bound to us now, King Lycomedes. You will continue to shelter Achilles here. I have no choice, he said. What if I will not be silent? Dedemeyer's colour was high. You have ruined me, you and your son. I have lain with him as you told me to, and my honour is gone. I have lain with him. You are a foolish girl, Thetis said. You will keep your peace or I will keep it for you. Dedemeyer stepped backwards, her eyes wide. I am pregnant, the princess whispered. I saw the horror on Achilles' face, like Amedes made a noise of pain. My chest felt hollowed. Enough. I strode to the door. Wait! Achilles shouted. He caught up to me, seized my arm. Please, let me explain. She made me. I did not want to. She said... He was stumbling over his words. She said that if I did as she asked, she would tell you where I was. 
Your mother did not tell me where you were. Did you truly expect you would? Yes. His cheeks were flushed with shame. Forgive me, he said. I did not want it. It was not you. I did not... I did not like it. My throat was thick with the beginning of tears. There's nothing to forgive, I said. In the stories, the gods have the power to delay the moon's course if they wish, to spin a single night the length of many. Such was this night. We drank deeply, thirsty for all that we had missed in the weeks we were separated. It was not until the sky began to blanch that I remembered what he'd said to Lycomedes in the hall. Your mother was trying to hide you from the war? He nodded. She does not want me to go to Troy. Why? I had always thought she wanted him to fight. I don't know, not yet, she says. And it was her idea? I gestured at the remnants of the dress. Of course. He made a face and yanked at his hair, hanging still in its womanly curls. My mind struggled with this. So truly it was not because of me that she took you? Daedemire was because of you, I think. He stared at his hands a moment. But the rest was the war. The next days passed quietly. We took meals in our room and slept long hours away from the palace. We had to be careful. Achilles could not be seen moving too quickly, climbing too skillfully, holding a spear. But there were many places where he could safely let his disguise drop. Daedemire left, as she had told me she would. Sorrow for her dragged at me. She's visiting an aunt, Lycomedes told the court. If there were questions, no one dared ask them. She would be gone until the child was born and Achilles could be named as father. News came of the war. Helen's former suitors had honoured their vow and Agamemnon's army was rich with princely blood. It was already spring. The air was pinched with frost and the grass still winter brown. We hurled pebbles from the cliff, leaning over to watch them skitter down the rock face. Achilles leaned forward. What is that? I squinted. There was a distant smudge that might have been a ship. If it's a ship, there will be news, I said, with a familiar clutch in my stomach. Each time I feared word would come of a search for the last of Helen's suitors, the Oathbreaker. It's a ship for certain, Achilles said. Achilles stood and tucked his wind-loosened hair back beneath its kerchief. We turned and went back down the path to the palace. He would go to the women's quarters and wait there until the messenger was gone. I went to my bedroom and slept. A knock woke me. A man stood inside the open door. He was sturdy and muscular with a close-cropped philosopher's beard. Something about it tugged at my memory. Do you mind if I sit? I nodded and he drew the chair to him. Who are you? I asked. The man laughed. A good question. I've been terribly rude, barging into your room like this. I am one of the great King Agamemnon's captains. I travel the islands and speak to promising young men, such as yourself, he inclined his head towards me, about joining our army against Troy. The fading light fell on his legs, revealing a pink scar that seemed his right calf from ankle to knee. My stomach dropped. He was older now and larger, come into the full flush of his strength. Odysseus. I was back in Tyndarius's hall, remembering his clever dark eyes that missed nothing. Did he know me? I forced down my fear. I'm sorry, I said, I did not hear you. What? Are you interested in joining us to fight? I'm not a very good soldier. His mouth twisted wryly. It's funny, no one seems to be when I come calling. <laughs> What's your name? I tried to sound as casual as he. Chironides? Well, Chironides, I will be here for a few days and I hope you will consider it. 
He made as if to go, then stopped. You know, it's funny, I keep thinking I've seen you before. The dinner bell had rung and the corridors were busy with servants carrying platters and chairs. When I stepped into the hall, my visitor was already there, standing with Lycomedes and another man. Chironides, Lycomedes acknowledged my arrival, this is Odysseus, ruler of Ithaca. Thank goodness for hosts, Odysseus said. I realized after I left that I never told you my name. And I did not ask because I knew. It had been a mistake. I widened my eyes. You're a king. I dropped to a knee in my best startled obeisance. Actually, he's only a prince, a voice drawled. I'm the one who's a king. I looked up to meet the third man's eyes. This is the Lord Diomedes, king of Argos, Lycomedes said, a comrade of Odysseus and another suitor of Helen's, though I remembered no more than his name. Lord, I bowed to him. Well, Lycomedes gestured to the table, shall we eat? I was hoping for a glimpse of the famous dancers of your isle, Odysseus said. Lycomedes swallowed. Yes, he said, if you wish. We do. This was Diomedes. Lycomedes' eyes darted between the two men. Thetis had ordered him to keep the women away from visitors, but to refuse would be suspicious. He gestured sharply at a servant, who turned and ran from the hall. The women were still making small adjustments of clothes and hair as they entered the hall. Achilles was among them, his head carefully covered, his gaze modestly down. When the dance had finished, Odysseus stood. We are truly honoured by your performance. As tokens of our admiration, we have brought gifts for you. A murmur of excitement. Luxuries did not come often to Skiros. The servants brought trunks forth and began unloading them on the long tables. Please take what you would like, Odysseus said. The girls moved swiftly to the tables and I watched them fingering the bright trinkets. Achilles kept to the back, drifting slowly along the tables. A movement at the far end of the hall caught my eye. Diomedes had crossed the chamber and was speaking with one of his servants, who nodded and left through the large double doors. I looked back to Achilles. He was holding some earrings up to his ears now, playing at girlishness. It amused him. A trumpet blew, loud and panicked. A sustained note followed by three short blasts, our signal for utmost impending disaster. Like Amedes lurched to his feet, girls screamed. All the girls but one. Before the final blast was finished, Achilles had swept up one of the silvered swords. He leapt the table in a blur, his other hand grabbing a spear from it as he passed. He landed, and the weapons were already lifted, held with a deadly poise that was like no girl nor no man either. I yanked my gaze to Odysseus and Diomedes and was horrified to see them smiling. Greetings, Prince Achilles, Odysseus said. We've been looking for you. I stood helpless as the faces of Lycomedes' court registered Odysseus's words, turned towards Achilles, stared. Achilles slowly lowered the weapons. Lord Odysseus, he said. His voice was remarkably calm. Lord Diomedes. He inclined his head politely, one prince to another. I am honoured to have been the subject of so much effort. It was a good answer. Odysseus moved towards the door, confidently, as if never doubting but that Achilles would follow. After you, Diomedes smirked. Achilles hesitated, and his eyes went to me, just the barest glance. Oh, yes, Odysseus called over his shoulder. You're welcome to bring Patroclus along, if you like. We have business with him as well. The room had a few threadbare tapestries and four chairs. 
I forced myself to sit straight against the stiff wood back. Achilles' face was tight with emotion. Odysseus looked at him. The sons of Troy are known for their skill in battle, and their deaths will lift your name to the stars. If you miss this war, you will miss your chance at immortality. You will grow old in obscurity. Achilles frowned. Odysseus leaned back in his chair. I am fortunate to have some knowledge of the gods, he smiled, and the gods have seen fit to share with me a prophecy about you. What prophecy? Achilles asked slowly. That if you do not come to Troy, your godhead will wither in you, unused. Your strength will diminish. You will be... The doors blew open in a fury of flying splinters. Thetis stood in the doorway, hot as living flame. Her divinity swept over us all, singeing our eyes. Odysseus stood. Greetings, Thetis. Her gaze went to him as a snake's to its prey. The air around Odysseus seemed to tremble as if with heat. He turned to Achilles. Ask your mother what she knows. Achilles met his mother's black eyes. Is it true what he says? It is true, but there is more and worse that he has not said. If you go to Troy, you will never return. You will die a young man there. Achilles' face went pale. It is certain. The slightest tremor over the still water of her face. It is certain. I cannot remember how we came to our room. Grief swelled inside me, choking me. You must not go. I almost said it a thousand times. I do not think I could bear it, he said at last. I knew he spoke not of his death, but of the nightmare Odysseus had spun the loss of his brilliance, the withering of his grace. I would not care, I said. Whatever you became, we could be together. He knew, but it was not enough. I will go, he said. I will go to Troy. Will you come with me? Perhaps in some other life I could have refused, but not in this one. He would sail to Troy, and I would follow, even into death. Yes, I whispered. Yes. When dawn came, I left the palace and came to the cliffs. I began to climb, arrowing upwards towards the most treacherous peak, my feet bleeding from the jagged rocks. I reached the summit. An idea had come to me as I climbed, fierce and reckless as I felt. Thetis! I screamed it into the snatching wind, my face towards the sea. Do not speak my name again. Her skin was paler even than usual, the first winter's ice. Get down. Your half-wit death will not save him. How much longer will he live? She made a noise in her throat like the bark of a seal. It took me a moment to understand that it was laughter. Why would you prepare yourself for it? Try to stop it? Yes, I answered, if I can. The sound again. Please, I knelt, please tell me. She considered me a moment. Hector's death will be first. Hector, thank you, I said. Her eyes narrowed. Do not presume to thank me. I have come for another reason. Her face was white as splintered bone. He will need to guard his honour carefully. He is too trusting. The men of Greece will not simply give up preeminence to another. And you. Her eyes flickered over my long arms and skinny knees. You will not disgrace him, do you understand? Yes, I said, and I did. His fame must be worth the life he paid for it. 
Something made me bold. Is Hector a skilled soldier? He is the best, but for my son. Her gaze flickered to the right, where the cliffs dropped away. He is coming, she said. Achilles crested the rise and came to where I sat. He looked at my face and my blooded skin. I heard you talking, he said. It was your mother. He knelt and took my foot in his lap. Gently he picked the fragments of rock from the wounds. You must not kill Hector, I said. He looked up, his beautiful face framed by the gold of his hair. My mother told you the rest of the prophecy. She did. A sly smile spread across his face. Well, why should I kill him? He's done nothing to me. For the first time then, I felt a kind of hope. We left that afternoon. Lycomedes came to bid us farewell. The three of us stood together, stiffly. There was one more thing to be done here, and I knew Achilles did not wish to do it. Lycomedes, my mother has asked me to convey her desires to you. The faintest tremor crossed the old man's face, but he met his son-in-law's gaze. It is about the child, he said. She wishes to raise him herself. She... Achilles faltered. The child will be a boy. When he's weaned, she will claim him. Silence. Then Lycomedes closed his eyes. I knew he was thinking of his daughter, arms empty of both husband and child. I wish you had never come, he said. I'm sorry, Achilles said. Leave me, the old king whispered. We obeyed. The ship we sailed on was Yair. As the sun slid lower in the sky, we drew close to the dark shadow of land where we would make camp. Odysseus smiled as we stood by the campsite that had been made for us. One tenth's enough, I hope I heard you prefer to share. Rooms and bedrolls both, they say. Beside me, I heard Achilles' breath stop. Come on now, there's no need for shame. It's a common enough thing amongst boys. Though you're not really boys any longer, are you? It's not true, I said. Odysseus raised an eyebrow. True is what men believe, and they believe this of you. Achilles' voice was tight. It's no business of yours. Inside the tent later, there was quietness between us. Do not disgrace him, the goddess had said. Achilles' jaw shot forward, stubborn. They are fools if they let my glory rise or fall on this. But Odysseus, Patroclus, I've given enough to them. I will not give them this. We arrived in Phthia two days later. As we drew closer, we saw the shore was thick with people, jostling impatiently. And the sound, at first it seemed to come from the waves, a rushing roar, but it grew louder with each stroke of our oars until we understood that it was voices, then words. Over and over it came, Prince Achilles, Aristos Achaion. It was that moment, perhaps, that our lives changed. He had chosen to become a legend, and this was the beginning. Go, I urged him. They are waiting for you. Three weeks passed. The three weeks that it took to organize soldiers, to equip a fleet, to pack up food and clothing to last the length of the war. A year, perhaps, or two. At last the day for our departure came. The drums began to beat, and the oars lifted and fell, taking us to Troy. But first to Aulis. Agamemnon had wanted his mighty force assembled in a single place before it sailed. A symbol, perhaps. The visible power of Greece offended. Horns blew. The Myrmidons from the other ships were already wading ashore. 
All along the beach, heads turned, Spartans, Argives, Mycenaeans, and all the rest. The news was rippling through them. Achilles is here. Bright sunlight broke and poured over Achilles, went rolling down his hair and back and skin, turning him to gold. Gasps amongst the men. Thetis, I thought. She was pulling his divinity forth, mantling it like cream on every inch of his skin. Agamemnon was waiting for us. His nose was curved and sharp like an eagle's beak. At his right side stood Odysseus and Diomedes. On his left was his brother Menelaus, king of Sparta, cause of war. Agamemnon stepped forward. He opened his hands in a gesture of welcome, waiting for the bows and oaths of loyalty he was owed. It was Achilles' place to kneel and offer them. He did not kneel. Agamemnon's jaw tightened. Around us the uneasy silence spread. Men exchanged glances. My hands clutched each other behind my back as I watched Achilles and the game he played. His face seemed cut from stone as he stared his warnings at the king of Mycenae. You do not command me. The silence went on and on. Then, just as Odysseus moved forward to intervene, Achilles spoke. I am Achilles, son of Peleus, God-born, best of the Greeks. I have come to bring you victory. A second of startled silence. Then the men roared their approval. Pride became us. Heroes were never modest. Agamemnon's eyes went flat, and then Odysseus was there, his hand hard on Achilles' shoulder as his voice smoothed the air. Agamemnon, lord of men, we have brought the prince Achilles to pledge his allegiance to you. His look warned Achilles, it is not too late. But Achilles simply smiled and stepped forward so that Odysseus's hand fell off him. I come freely to offer my aid to your cause, he said loudly. I am honoured to fight with so many noble warriors. Another cheer, loud and long. Finally, from the deep crag of his face, Agamemnon spoke. Indeed, I have the finest army in the world, and I welcome you to it, young prince of Phthia. His smile cut sharply. It's a pity you were so slow to come. There was an implication here, but Achilles had no chance to answer. Agamemnon was already speaking again, his voice lifted over us all. Men of Greece, we leave for Troy tomorrow. Repair to your camps and make yourselves ready. Gasping. Beside me, Achilles slept, his skin as damp as mine. There was no wind, I realized. That was the strangeness. I remember thinking, if it keeps up like this, we won't be able to sail tomorrow. The days pass and our foreheads creased with worry. A month passed. We are all, I think, going to go mad, suffocated by the weight of the motionless air. Finally, word comes. Agamemnon has spoken with the chief priest, Calchas. He believes it is the goddess Artemis we have offended and gives the usual prescription, a sacrifice. At our next camp meeting, Agamemnon announces that his daughter, a priestess of Artemis, is being brought from Mycenae. Then we hear more. She is being brought for marriage to one of the kings. Perhaps she can soothe the raging goddess. Agamemnon summons Achilles and me to his tent. Prince Achilles, perhaps you've heard. I have a daughter, Iphigenia. I would wish her to be your wife. We stare. Achilles stutters. 
we are to pretend that the princess of Skiros doesn't exist? Achilles is watching for my answer. It will make peace with Agamemnon. I nod, slightly. Achilles offers his hand. I will be proud to name you father-in-law. Agamemnon takes the younger man's hand. I watch his eyes. They are cold and almost sad. A few days later, Iphigenia stepped out of her chariot and onto our makeshift marketplace, a wooden platform with a raised altar behind it. She was very young, not yet fourteen. She threw her arms around her father's neck. Achilles stepped forward to meet her. The girl stumbled. I remember Achilles' shift to catch her, but she wasn't falling. Agamemnon yanked something from his belt. It flashed in the sun as he swung it. Blood spurted over the altar and spilled down her dress. Agamemnon spoke into silence. The goddess is appeased. Human sacrifice was an abomination, and his own daughter. We were horrified, and there was violence in us. Then, before we could move, something on our cheeks, wind, jaws unclenched and muscles loosened. We left the next day. From the stern of our ship, Aulis's beach looked strangely bare. Only the ash-white ruins of the girl's pyre were left to mark our passage. On the seventh day we came to Lemnos, just across from the Hellespont's narrow mouth. We found a pool some distance from the camp and sat by it. Bugs shivered on its surface. We were only two days from Troy. I looked up. Achilles' face was in shadow. My father told me to think of them like animals, the men I kill. He did not look up from his vigil over the water's surface. I do not think I can do it, he said. I cannot stop seeing it. Her death. She was a girl and innocent. These will be men that you fight, warriors who will kill you if you do not strike first, I said. He turned to look at me, his gaze intent. But you will not fight, even if they strike at you. Because I don't have the skill, I said. I don't think that's the only reason. Perhaps not, I said at last. But you will forgive me. I reached for his hand and took it. I have no need to forgive you. You cannot offend me. At last the drums began to beat and the line of ships thrust forward stroke by stroke. We stood at the prow, watching the shore draw closer. There are men on the beach, Achilles said. He squinted, with weapons. Before I could respond, a horn blew from somewhere in the fleet and others answered it. The alarm. We had thought we'd surprised the Trojans, but they were waiting for us. The men on the beach were undoubtedly soldiers, all dressed in the dark crimson of the house of Priam. A chariot flew along their ranks, churning up the sand. The man in it wore a horsehair helmet, and even from a distance we could see the strong lines of his body. Hector. Shouts came down the line in confusion. Agamemnon had no orders. Hold position. Do not make landfall. We are almost in range of their arrows, Achilles commented. He did not seem alarmed by it, though around us there was panic. I stared at the shore coming closer. Hector was gone now, but there was another man before us, a captain, in leather armour. He pulled back the string of his bow, sighted along the shaft, and prepared to kill his first Greek. He never had the chance. I did not see Achilles move, but I heard it, the whistle of air and his soft exhalation. The bowman fell to the sand, pierced by Achilles' spear. The news flared along the line of Greek ships. First blood was ours, spilled by the godlike prince of Phthia. Achilles' face was still, almost peaceful. Our men began to stream to shore. The Trojans were well marshalled, but the beach offered no natural defence and we outnumbered them. At a command from Hector, they seized their fallen comrades and relinquished the beach. Their point had been made. 
they would not be so easy to kill. We pulled the first ships onto the sand. Scouts were sent ahead to watch for further Trojan ambush. There was a hectic energy to the men, a manic purpose. We stood on the hill that marked the boundary between sand and grass and regarded the thing we had come for. Troy. Even so far away, its stone walls caught the sharp sun and gleamed. When the sun hung low in the sky, Agamemnon called the first council meeting. The kings were divided between attack and diplomacy. Should we not perhaps try to be civilized first? Surprisingly, Menelaus was the loudest voice in favor of a parley. I will gladly go myself to treat with them, he said. It is my office. What have we come all this way for if you intend to talk them into surrender? Diomedes complained. I could have stayed at home. Agamemnon rubbed his chin and swung his gaze over the room of kings. Raids first, then perhaps we will send an embassy. We begin tomorrow. Raiding was typical siege warfare. You would not attack the city, but the lands that surrounded it, that supplied it with grain and meat. You would kill those who resisted, make serfs of those who did not. Eventually, the gates would have to open. The sun was just setting as we walked back up the beach to our camp. We stopped a moment, surveying the new camp and the sea beyond. A question had burned in me since the battle on the ships, but there'd been no time before now to ask it. Do you think of them as animals, as your father said? I asked. Achilles shook his head. I did not think at all. Over our heads the gulls screamed and wheeled. I tried to imagine him bloodied and murderous after his first raid tomorrow. Are you frightened? I asked. No, he answered. This is what I was born for. Next morning Achilles came to bid me farewell. Will you help me put the rest of my armor on? I nodded and handed him his helmet, and watched as he fitted it over his ears, leaving only a thin strip of his face open. He leaned forward towards me, framed by bronze, smelling of sweat and leather and metal. I closed my eyes, felt his lips on mine, the only part of him still soft. Then he was gone. I lay on our bed and listened to the creaking of his chariot wheels as they bore him off. As long as Hector lived, he could not die. I closed my eyes and slept. I woke to his nose on mine, pressing insistently against me as I struggled from the webbing of my dreams. He smelled sharp and strange and for a moment I was almost revolted by this creature which shoved its face against mine. He was covered in blood, vivid splashes not yet dried to rust. My first thought was terror, that he was wounded. Slowly my sleep-stupid brain understood. It was not his. They could not get close enough to touch me, he said. There was a sort of wondering triumph in his voice. I did not know how easy it would be, like nothing. The men cheered me afterwards. His words were almost dreamy. I wish you had seen. How many? I asked. Twelve. Twelve men with nothing at all to do with Paris or Helen or any of us. Farmers. There was a bitterness to my voice that seemed to bring him back to himself. They were armed, he said quickly. How many will you kill tomorrow, do you think? He heard the edge in my voice and looked away. The pain on his face struck me and I was ashamed. Where was my promise that I would forgive him? I'm sorry, I said. I asked him to tell me what it was like, all of it, as we had always spoken to each other, and he did everything. How his first spear had pierced the hollow of a man's cheek. How the village had smelled terrible when they left it, muddy and metallic with the flies already landing. I listened to every word, imagining it was a story only. 
With the raids came the distribution. Each man was allowed to keep what he personally won. Armour that he stripped from a dead soldier, a jewel he tore from the widow's neck. But the rest, ewers and rugs and vases, were carried to the dais for distribution. First allotment usually went to the army's best soldier, but Agamemnon named himself first and Achilles second. I was surprised that Achilles only shrugged. Everyone knows I'm better. This only makes Agamemnon look greedy. He was right, of course. In the third week, a girl stood on the dais. She was beautiful, her skin a deep brown, her hair black and gleaming. The men gathered eagerly. They knew what her presence meant. Agamemnon was giving us permission for bed slaves. Agamemnon mounted the dais, and I saw his eyes slide over the girl. He was known for his appetites. I do not know what came over me then, but I seized Achilles' arm and spoke into his ear. Take her. He turned to me, his eyes wide with surprise. Take her before Agamemnon does, please. He hesitated, but only a second. Men of Greece, Achilles stepped forward, still in the day's armour. Great king of Mycenae, I would have this girl as my war prize. At the back of the dais, Odysseus raised an eyebrow. The men around us murmured. Irritation flashed in Agamemnon's eyes. I saw the thoughts turn across his face. She was beautiful, but there would be other girls. I grant your wish, Prince of Phthia. The crowd shouted its approval. They liked their commanders generous and their heroes bold and lusty. When she understood that she was to come with us, I saw her swallow, her gaze darting over Achilles. Come, Achilles commanded. We turned to go. Head down, she followed. Agamemnon rose. We have tried diplomacy and been rebuffed. Our only honourable course is war. Tomorrow, you go to win the glory you deserve. Every last man of you. Every last man. Fear sluiced through me. Of course I would be expected to fight. Just before dawn, Achilles helped me arm. Greaves, gauntlets a bronze breastplate. Walking out of the tent into the morning sun, I felt foolish, like someone trying on an older brother's clothing. We could hear the army before we saw it, boasting, clattering weapons, blowing horns. We marched forward and arrayed ourselves, Achilles out in front. Before us was the wide, flat plain of Troy, ending in the massive gates and towers of the city. Stay behind me, Achilles turned to say. I nodded. A trumpet blew. Now. It was now. In a clanking, clattering mass, we lurched into a run. A dead-run charge that met the enemy in the middle. The front lines collided in an explosion of sound, a burst of spraying splinters and bronze and blood. I did not kill anyone, or even attempt to. At the end of the morning, it felt like I'd run for miles, though somehow I always seemed to be in a strange pocket of emptiness into which no men came. It was a measure of my dullness, my dizziness, that it took me until mid-afternoon to see that this was Achilles' doing. His gaze was on me always, preternaturally sensing the moment when a soldier's eyes widen at the easy target I presented. Before they drew another breath, he would cut them down. Dusk came at last and released us, limping and exhausted, back to our tents, dragging the wounded and dead. A good day, our king said, clapping each other on the back. Tomorrow we will do it again. We did it again and again. A day of fighting became a week, 
then a month, then two. It was a strange war. No territory was gained, no prisoners were taken. It was for honour only, man against man. The leaders, once buoyant with hopes of swift victory, grew resigned to a lengthy engagement. Achilles flourished. He gloried in his own strength, like a racehorse too long penned, allowed at last to run. With a fevered, impossible grace, he fought off ten, fifteen, twenty-five men. Sometimes, as I watched him, I would catch sight of a square of ground where soldiers did not go. It would be near to Achilles, and if I stared at it, it would grow light, then lighter. At last it might reluctantly yield its secret. A woman, white as death. She did not help her son. She did not need to, only watched, as I did, with her huge black eyes. From far off, glimpsed only quickly through the corridors of shifting men, I saw Hector. He was always alone, strangely solitary in the space the other men gave him. I never tried to get closer to him, and neither did Achilles. Afterwards, when Agamemnon would ask him when he would confront the Prince of Troy, Achilles would smile his most guileless, maddening smile. What has Hector ever done to me? The rescued girl came often to wait for Achilles with me. She was an Anatolian farm girl, but she did know a little Greek. A few words her father had taught her when he heard the army was coming. Mercy was one. Yes, and please... And what do you want? Her name was Briseis, and I grew to understand her expressions first, the thoughtful quiet of her eyes, the smiles she would hide behind her hand. We could not talk much in those early days, but her gaze was bright with observation, and the words began to pile up. There was a peace in sitting beside her during the empty hours when Achilles was gone the waves rolling companionably over our feet. One festival day after our landing at Troy, Achilles rose at dawn. Where are you going? I asked him. My mother, he said. His mother. Her grief only made her visits longer. The sun would be nearly at its peak before he would return. I would wait, pacing and unsettled. Do you want to walk up to the woods? Briseis asked. Just the low sweetness of her voice helped take me out of myself. She seemed to know the secrets of the woods just as Chiron had. Where does he stay so long? She said. Why shouldn't she know? It wasn't a secret. His mother is a goddess, I said. A sea nymph. He goes to see her. I had expected her to be startled, but she only nodded. I thought that he was something. He does not, she paused. He does not move like a human. At that moment Achilles crested the hill. Briseis returned to her tent. Achilles threw himself down on the ground, hand behind his head. What did you talk about with your mother, I asked. She's worried about me, he said. She says there's a strangeness among the gods and they're fighting with each other. She fears that the gods have promised me fame, but not how much. This was a new worry. I think she's afraid that someone else is going to kill Hector before me. Another new fear. Achilles' life suddenly cut shorter than it already was. Who does she mean? I don't know. Ajax has tried and failed. Diomedes, too. They are the best after me. What about Menelaus? Never. It's me or no one. You will not do it. I tried not to let it sound like begging. No. He was quiet a moment. But I can see it. Like in a dream. I can see myself throwing the spear. See him fall. I walk up to the body and stand over it. Dread rose in my chest. And then what? I look down at his blood and know my death is coming. 
but what I feel most of all is relief. Do you think it can be prophecy? The question seemed to make him self-conscious. No, I think it's nothing at all. A daydream. Well, I'm sure you're right, I said. After all, Hector hasn't done anything to you. He smiled. Yes, he said. I've heard that. It was a strange time. Over us, every second, hung the terror of Achilles' destiny, while the murmurs of war among the gods grew louder. I have heard that men who live by a waterfall cease to hear it. In such a way did I learn to live beside the rushing torrent of his doom. The days passed, and he lived. The months passed. The miracle of a year. Then two. Our camp began to form a sort of family, drawn together around the flames of the dinner fire, Achilles and I, and then the women, originally only Briseis, but now a small clump of bobbing faces, reassured by the welcome she had received. Briseis told stories, strange and dreamlike tales. They were beautiful, told in her low, sing-song voice. Later, when we were alone, Achilles would repeat little snatches of them, and I was pleased because I felt he had seen her, had understood why I had spent my days with her when he was gone. She was one of us now, I thought, a member of our circle, for life. Years passed, and a soldier, one of Ajax's, began to complain about the war's length. Four years, he said, and nothing to show for it. When will we leave? Slowly his discontent spread from one camp to the next. It had been a bad season, particularly wet and miserable for fighting. Injuries abounded, rashes and mud-turned ankles. Sullen and scratching, men began to loiter around the agora. At first they did nothing but collect in small groups, whispering. Then their voices grew louder. Four years... How do we know she's even in there? Troy will never submit to us. The next morning, several hundred men refused to fight. They threw their swords and shields onto the dais in a heap and blocked the agora. When Agamemnon tried to force his way through, they folded their arms and would not budge. When the man in front of him spat at his feet, Agamemnon lifted his scepter and brought it down sharply on his head. We all heard the crack of breaking bone. The man dropped. I do not think Agamemnon meant to hit him so hard. He seemed frozen, staring at the body at his feet. The news hissed through the men with a sound like a fire lighting. Agamemnon's face was filled with the growing realization of his mistake. He was surrounded now. I held my breath, sure I was about to see him die. Men of Greece! Startled faces turned to the shout. Achilles stood atop a pile of shields on the dais. You are angry, he said. This caught their attention. It was unusual for a general to admit that his troops might feel such a thing. Speak your grievance, he said. We want to leave, the voice came from the back of the crowd. The war is hopeless. A surging murmur of agreement. It has been four years. This last was the angriest of all. For me, these four years had been an abundance, time that had been wrested from the hands of miserly fates. But for them, it was a life stolen from children and wives, from home. It is your right to question such things, Achilles said. You were promised victory. I caught a glimpse of Agamemnon's face curdled with anger. Tell me, Achilles said, do you think Aristos Achaion fights in hopeless wars? The men did not answer. Well, no, someone said. Achilles nodded gravely. No, I do not. I am here because I believe that we will win. That is fine for you, a different voice. But what of those who wish to go? Agamemnon opened his mouth to answer. I could imagine what he might have said. No one leaves. Deserters will be executed. But he was lucky that Achilles was swifter. You're welcome to leave whenever you like. We are? The voice was dubious. Of course. 
Achilles paused and offered his most guileless smile. But I get your share of the treasure when we take Troy. I felt the tension in the air ease, heard a few huffs of appreciative laughter. The Prince Achilles spoke of treasure to be won, and where there was greed, there was hope. Achilles saw the change in them. He said, It is past time to take the field. The Trojans will start to think we are afraid. He drew his flashing sword and held it in the air. Who dares to show them otherwise? There were shouts of agreement, followed by a general clanging as men reclaimed their armour. They hoisted the dead man and carried him off. Everyone agreed that he'd always been troublesome. Achilles leapt down from the dais and passed Agamemnon with a formal nod. The king of Mycenae said nothing, but I watched his eyes follow Achilles for a long time after that. One day in the ninth year, a girl mounted the dais. A priest's daughter. I nudged Achilles and he nodded. But before he could claim her, Agamemnon stepped forward. This is Chryseis, he said, and I take her for myself. Then he pulled her from the dais, leading her roughly to his tent. It was barely a month after that that the girl's father came, walking down the beach with a staff of gold-studded wood threaded with garlands. He gave his name, Chrysis and identified himself as a high priest of Apollo. I have come to ransom my daughter, he said, taken unlawfully by the Greek army from our temple. That word, unlawful, had been sharp as a drawn sword, but we could not say he was wrong to use it. Agamemnon stepped forward, broad as a bear, his neck muscles twisting in anger. I am this army's commander, he spat. She is my prize, and I will not give her up, now or ever. You will depart now, priest, or even your garlands will not save you. Without a word, Chrysis turned and stepped from the dais and strode back up the beach. That night, slipping amongst us like a snake, the plague began. When we woke the next morning, we saw the mules drooping against their fences, eyes rolling. Then, by midday, it was the dogs. The next morning, it was the men. Another day then, and another, and every company, every king, had lost dozens of soldiers. We remembered Chrysis and his righteous outrage at Agamemnon's blasphemy. And we remembered, too, which god he served the divinity of light and medicine and plague. On the tenth day of the plague, Achilles mounted the dais. It was not forbidden for someone other than the general to call a meeting, but it had never been done in our ten years at Troy. Agamemnon shouldered through the crowd. What is this? Achilles greeted him politely. I have gathered the men to speak of the plague. Agamemnon's shoulders were hunched forward with shame-sprung rage. He should have called this meeting himself long ago. Achilles stepped forward and smiled. Kings, men of the Greek kingdoms, how can we fight a war when we're dying of plague? It's time, past time, that we learned what we have done to deserve a god's anger. Agamemnon's lips were pulled back to show his teeth. We have a priest here among us, a man close to the gods. Should we not ask him to speak? A hopeful ripple of assent went through the men. They towed the priest, Calchas, forward out of the crowd. His voice wheedled and ducked like a weasel leaving its nest. The auguries have shown that it is the god Apollo who is angry. Apollo. The name went through the host like a wind in summer wheat. Calchas' eyes flickered to Agamemnon and then back to Achilles. He is offended, it seems, at the treatment of his dedicated servant, Chrysis. 
Agamemnon's shoulders were rigid. To appease him, the girl Chryseis must be returned without ransom, and High King Agamemnon must offer prayers and sacrifices. Agamemnon wheeled on the men, his face twisted in rage. Last time it was my daughter. Now you seek to humiliate me before the army. The girl is mine, and I will not give her up. Have you forgotten who I am? King Agamemnon, Achilles stepped forward. I don't think anyone has forgotten that you are the leader of this host, but now, while we die, you complain about the loss of a girl you should have ransomed long ago. You say nothing of the lives you've taken or the plague you have started. Achilles held up a hand. I do not mean to dishonour you. I only wish to end the plague. Send the girl to her father and be done. Agamemnon's cheeks were creased with fury. I understand you, Achilles. You've never learned your place among men. Achilles opened his mouth to answer. You will be silent or you will be sorry. I do not think, High King, that you can afford to say such things to me. Do you threaten me? Agamemnon shouted. It is not a threat. What is your army without me? You have always thought too much of yourself, Agamemnon sneered. When all of these brave men came to Aulis, they knelt to offer me their loyalty, all of them but you. I think we have indulged your arrogance long enough. It is time, past time, that you swore the oath. I am not the one who should kneel. It was too far. I felt the men shift around me. Do you hear his pride? Agamemnon turned to Achilles. You will not kneel? Achilles' face was like stone. I will not. Then you are a traitor to this army and will be punished like one. Let us start with that girl. Briseis is her name. She will do as penance for the girl you have forced me to return. The air died in my lungs. She is mine, Achilles said. You cannot take her. If you try, your life is forfeit. Agamemnon's answer came quickly. I do not fear you. I will have her. Around me were the shocked faces of kings. Briseis was a war prize, a living embodiment of Achilles' honour. In taking her, Agamemnon denied Achilles the full measure of his worth. The men muttered, but no one spoke. Agamemnon, Achilles said. I flinched from the roughness of his voice. Your words have today caused your own death and the death of your men. I will fight for you no longer. Without me... Your army will fall. Hector will grind you to bones and bloody dust, and I will watch it and laugh. You will come crying for mercy, but I will give none. He spat a huge wet smack between Agamemnon's feet. Achilles seized the extra tent flap covering our door and ripped it free as he passed. We must do something, I said. We can hide Briseis in the woods or... He will pay now, Achilles said. There was a fierce triumph in his voice. Let him come for her. He has doomed himself. What are you talking about, I stared at him. Briseis! I can do nothing for her he said at last. If Agamemnon chooses this path, he must bear the consequences. A feeling as if I were falling into ocean depths, weighted with stones. You're not going to let him take her. He would not look at me. It is his choice. I told him what would happen if he did. You know what he will do to her. He would deprive me of my honour. He would punish me. 
I will let him. You will not help her? There is nothing I can do. She's one of us. Where's your honour? And then, suddenly, I understood. I do not know this man. My rage towards him is as hot as blood. I will never forgive him. He has given her to Agamemnon, knowing what will happen. Now he expects that I will wait here, impotent and obedient. He's standing outside the tent when I return. His tunic is damp from the sea. How's your mother? She is well. We know the storm is coming. I look at him full in the face. I went to Agamemnon. I told him of your plan. My plan? To let him rape Briseis so that you might revenge yourself on him. Saying it out loud is more shocking than I thought it would be. I read his shoulders. They're set, the tension of his neck. So you warned him? I did. You know if he'd done it, I could have killed him. Or exiled him. The men would have honoured me like a god. I know. There is a silence. A dangerous one. Her safety for my honour. Are you happy with your trade? There is no honour in betraying your friends. It is strange, he says, that you would speak against betrayal. There is more pain in those words almost than I can bear. It was the only way. You chose her, he says, over me. Over your pride. His fists tighten. Now, perhaps, the attack will come. My life is my reputation. His breath sounds ragged. It is all I have. I will not live much longer. Memory is all I can hope for. You know this. And would you let Agamemnon destroy it? Would you help him take it from me? I would not, I say, but I would have the memory be worthy of the man. No fame is worth what you did today. He turns away again. It is done then. She is safe. Yes, she is safe. A tired breath. You are a better man than I. The beginning of hope. Briseis will not be harmed and Achilles will remember himself. There will be a moment after this and another after that. No, I say. I put my hand to the warmth of his skin. It is not true. You left yourself today. And now you are returned. Do not say that, he says, until you've heard the rest of what I've done. I remember how he looked when he left to see his mother. Wild, fevered, hard as granite. I imagine him kneeling before her, weeping with rage. They've insulted him, he says to her. They've ruined his immortal reputation. She listens. He has an idea, a god's idea, full of vengeance and wrath. His weeping stops. He will do it? Achilles asks. He means Zeus, king of the gods, whose head is wreathed in clouds, whose hands can hold the thunderbolt itself. He will do it, Thetis says. He is in my debt. Zeus will make the Greeks lose and lose and lose until they are crushed against the sea. Masts and prows splintering on their backs. And then they will see who they must beg for. What if he will not beg? I ask Achilles. Then he will die. They will all die.
we wake to shouts and thunder. The attack has begun, and Zeus is keeping his bargain, punctuating the Trojans' advance with celestial encouragement. From down the beach, the crack of a mast falling, more men dead. This is the moment that Achilles and his mother have summoned, the Greeks, routed and desperate, without him. Do you not fear that the men will hate you? I ask. They should hate Agamemnon, it's his pride that kills them. And yours. All around me men are carrying fallen comrades. Now these men are ruined, pulpy with blood and split bone, because of him, because of me. You are destroying yourself. You will not be loved for this. Please. Patroclus, the word was sharp. I will not do this. Do not ask me again. He would not fight. The men would die and his honour with it. Yet still my mind scrabbled in its corners, desperate to find the thing that might soften him. For me, then, I said, save them for me. I saw the struggle in his eyes. I cannot. I looked at the stone of his beautiful face and despaired. If you love me. No, I cannot. If I yield, Agamemnon can dishonour me whenever he wishes. The kings will not respect me, nor the men. Do you think I wish them all to die? But I cannot. I will not let him take this from me. Then do something else. Send me in your place, put me in your armour, and I will lead the Myrmidons. They will think it is you. The words shocked us both. They seemed to come through me as though spoken straight from a god's mouth. Do you see? You will not have to break your oath, yet the Greeks will be saved. But you cannot fight, he said. I will not have to. They're so frightened of you. If I show myself, they will run. No, it is too dangerous. Please, I gripped him. Think. Agamemnon will know you defy him still, but the men will love you. There is no fame greater than this. You will prove to them all that your phantom is more powerful than Agamemnon's whole army. I watched his eyes, saw the reluctance giving way, inch by inch. He held up his hand. Swear to me, he said, swear to me that if you go, you will not fight them. You will stay with Automedon in the chariot. Of course, I'm not mad. <laughs> to frighten them, that is all. I was drenched and giddy. I would save the men. I would save him from himself. You will let me? He hesitated another moment. Then slowly, he nodded. Achilles knelt, the leather underskirt, lastly the helmet to cover my dark hair. He kissed me, catching me up in a soft, opened warmth. Then he took my hand, and we went outside to the Myrmidons. They were lined up, armoured and suddenly fearsome, their layers of metal flashing like the bright wings of cicadas. Achilles led me to the chariot, already yoked to its three-horse team. Don't leave the chariot, don't throw your spears. And I understood that he was afraid that I would give myself away if I actually fought. Are you ready? Automedon asked. I took a last look at Achilles standing by the side of the chariot. I reached for his hand and he gripped it. Be careful, he said. I will. There was more to say, but for once we did not say it. I turned back to Automedon. I'm ready, I told him. The chariot began to roll. I felt the wind snatch at my crest. The horsehair was streaming behind me. We flew past the first clumps of men, their faces blurred by, but I heard their shouts of recognition and sudden joy. Achilles! It is Achilles! I felt a fierce and flooding relief. It is working. 
and then, head tilted back, spear raised, feet braced against the side of the chariot, I screamed, a wild, frenzied sound that shook my whole body. A thousand faces, Trojan and Greek, turned to me in frozen shock and joy. With a crash, we were among them. I screamed again and heard an answering cry from the embattled Greeks, an animal howl of hope. The Trojans began to break apart before me, scrambling backwards with gratifying terror. Perhaps it was the armour moulding me, perhaps it was the years of watching him, but the position my shoulder found was not the old wobbling awkwardness. And then, before I could think about what I did, I threw a long straight spiral into the breast of a Trojan, his body pitched backwards, dead. Automaton's mouth was moving, his eyes wide, but already my other spear hefted itself into my hand. I can do this. The horses veered again, and men scattered from our path. My eye caught on a Trojan, and I threw. He fell, pierced through the thigh in a blow I knew had shattered bone. Two. All around me men screamed Achilles' name. The Greeks began to rally. Menelaus killing a man beside me. Desperately, the Trojans scrambled for their chariots in full retreat. Hector ran among them, crying out for order. He gained his chariot, began to lead the men to the gate and on to the plain beyond. Go! Follow them! We passed the fleeing Trojans and curved around to meet them as they ran. My spears aimed and aimed again, splitting open bellies, throats, lungs and hearts. It is so easy. From the roiling melee bursts a chariot. The driver is huge, his long hair flying behind him as he lashes his horses to foam and froth. It is Sarpedon, son of Zeus. His arm lifts to aim his spear at my heart. There is a breath of wind over my shoulder. The spear's sharp point buries itself in the ground behind me. I heft my spear as if in a dream. This is the man who has killed so many Greeks. No! Automedon catches at my arm. With his other hand he lashes the horses. Sarpedon turns his chariot, and for a moment I think he's given up. Then he angles in again and lifts his spear. The chariot bucks into the air. I am thrown onto the grass and my head smacks the ground. My helmet falls forward into my eyes and I shove it back. From afar Sarpedon comes, his chariot driving relentlessly towards me. I stand to meet him. I lift my spear. Imagine how Achilles would do it, feet planted to the earth, back muscles twisting. I cast the spear. It hits his belly, where the armour plate is thick. It does not pierce him, but it knocks him back a single step. It is enough. His weight tilts the chariot, and he tumbles from it. I clutch my sword hilt. Then I see the unnatural broken angle of his neck. I have killed the son of Zeus, but they must think it is Achilles who's done it. I retrieve my spear and stab it down with all my strength into his chest. Automedon drags me onto the chariot. He has cut the dead horse free, right at the wheels. He is gasping, white with fear. We must go! My head buzzes with a red savagery. In our escape, Automedon has driven us close to Troy. The walls loom up at me. Achilles had warned me to beware of archers on the towers, but the charge and rout has happened so quickly no one has returned yet. Troy is utterly unguarded. A child could take it now. The thought of Troy's fall pierces me with vicious pleasure. It is their fault, all of it. We have lost ten years, and so many men, and Achilles will die because of them. No more. I leap from the chariot and run to the walls. My fingers find slight hollows in the stone like blind eye sockets. Climb. I will crack their uncrackable city and capture Helen, the precious gold yoke within. Patroclus!
a voice like music above me. I look up to see a man leaning on the walls as if sunning, dark hair to his shoulders, a finely cut face that glows with something more than human. Apollo. He smiles, then reaches down. Fingers scoop the fabric of my tunic and hold me dangling. Then let me fall. My head cracks the ground. Around me a blurring crowd of faces gathers. And then I feel the prickling chill of air against my sweat-dampened forehead, the loosening of my dark hair, my helmet. I see it beside me, overturned like an empty snail shell. My armour too has shaken loose. All those straps that Achilles had tied, undone by the god. The frozen silence is broken by the hoarse, angry screams of Trojans. My mind startles to life. I am unarmed and alone, and they know I am only Patroclus. Run! I lunge to my feet. I see a man levelling a spear at my face. Somehow I am quick enough and it passes over me, ruffling my hair like a lover's breath. The spear that I do not see comes from behind. I stumble. The blood gushes hot on my chilled skin. The Trojan faces waver, and I fall. My blood runs through my fingers and onto the grass. The crowd parts, and I see a man walking towards me. I know him, hip bones like the cornice of a temple, his brow furrowed and stern. He's coming to kill me. Hector. Remembrance drums in me like the pulse beat of blood in my ears. He cannot kill me. He must not. Achilles will not let him live if he does. And Hector must live always. He must never die. Desperately I turn to the men around me and scrabble at their knees. Please, I croak, please. But they are watching their prince, Priam's eldest son and his inexorable steps towards me. Hector's spear lifts over me, tipping like a picture, and then it falls, a spill of bright silver, towards me. The spearhead submerges in a sear of pain so great that my breath stops. My head drops back against the ground, and the last image I see is of Hector, leaning seriously over me, twisting his spear inside me as if he is stirring a pot. The last thing I think is Achilles. Achilles screams, Hector! He tears through the advancing Trojan ranks, scattering chests and faces, marking them with the meteor of his fury. Chest heaving, Hector races towards Troy's wide river, now a muddied, churning red, choked with corpses and armour. He gains the other shore, Achilles leaps to follow, there is a grove at the base of Troy's high walls. It is there that Hector, at last, stops running. The two men face each other. Achilles lifts his ashen spear. No, I beg him. It is his own death he holds, his own blood that will spill. Hector's eyes are wide. Grant me this. Give my body to my family when you have killed me. Achilles makes a sound like choking. There are no bargains between lions and men. I will kill you and eat you raw. His spear point flies in a dark whirlwind to catch the hollow at Hector's throat. Achilles returns to the tent where my body waits. He is rust-red, 
as if he is swum in the vast, dark chambers of a heart. He is dragging Hector's body behind him, pierced through its heels with a leather thong. Achilles rises at dawn to drag Hector's body around the walls of the city for all of Troy to see. He does it again at midday, and again at evening. He does not see the Greeks begin to avert their eyes from him. Thetis is waiting for him in the tent. What do you want? You must stop this. Apollo is angry. He seeks vengeance upon you. Let him. He kneels, smooths back the hair on my forehead. Achilles, listen to me. You go too far in this. What does it matter? He is dead. Can your power bring him back? No, nothing can. He is mortal, and mortals die. I am mortal. What good is Godhead if it cannot do this? I know you are mortal. She places each cold word as a tile in a mosaic. I left you too long on Pelion. It has ruined you. She gestures, a flick, at his tear-stained face. This is not my son. You act like a child. At twelve, Pyrrhus, your son, is more of a man than you. Pyrrhus? The word is a gasp. He will come and Troy will fall. The city cannot be taken without him, the fates say. Achilles stares. You would bring him here. He is the next, Aristos Achaion. I am not dead yet. You may as well be. The words are a lash. I am done. There is no more I can do to save you. Her black eyes seem to contract like dying stars. I am glad that he is dead. It is the last thing she will ever say to him. An old man comes to our tent. He is filthy, his robes wet from swimming the river. I have come for my son, he says. The king of Troy moves across the room to kneel at Achilles' feet. Will you hear a father's prayer, mighty prince of Phthia? Achilles stares down at the man's shoulders. They are trembling with age, stooped with the burdens of grief. I beg you to return my son's body for burial, so his soul does not wander lost. As he speaks, he is careful not to let himself look at the shadow, face down in the corner. You show courage to come here alone, Achilles says. How did you know I would not kill you? I did not know, said Priam. There is silence. Priam's eyes find the other body, mine, lying on the bed. That is your friend. I am sorry, Priam says, that it was my son who took him from you. Yet in grief, men must help each other, though they are enemies. Nothing moves in the tent. Then Achilles stands. I will have my servants prepare your son's body. When they are gone, he slumps next to me, his face against my belly. My skin grows slippery under the steady fall of his tears. The next day he carries me to the pyre. The flames surround me and I feel myself slipping further from life, thinning to only the faintest shiver in the air. I yearn for the darkness and silence of the underworld, where I can rest. He puts my ashes in a golden urn and turns to the watching Greeks. When I am dead, I charge you to mingle our ashes and bury us together. Within the walls of Troy, a bow is strung by rushing hands. An arrow is selected and princely feet 
hurry upstairs to a tower that tilts over a battlefield of dead and dying, where a god is waiting. It is easy for Paris to find his target. The man moves slowly, like a lion grown wounded and sick, but his gold hair is unmistakable. Paris knocks his arrow. Where do I aim? He is a man, Apollo says, not a god. Shoot him and he will die. Paris aims. The god touches his finger to the arrow's fletching, and the arrow flies, straight and silent, towards Achilles' back. Achilles smiles as his face strikes the earth. Agamemnon calls a council to discuss the tomb they will build. We should put it on the field where he fell, Nestor says. On the hill, I think, Odysseus says. I have come to take my father's place. A clear voice cuts across the room. A boy stands framed in the tent's doorway. His hair is bright red. He is beautiful, but coldly so. A winter's morning. Only the dullest would not know which father he means. I am the son of Achilles, he announces. The kings are staring. Most did not even know Achilles had a child. Only Odysseus has the wits to speak. May we know the name of Achilles' son? My name is Neoptolemus, called Pyrrhus. Lord of Mycenae, I offer myself to your army. Agamemnon's face is caught between disbelief and displeasure. You do not seem old enough. I have lived with the gods beneath the sea, he says. I come now to win the war for you. What? Agamemnon is aghast. If it is so, we are indeed glad to have you, Menelaus says. We were talking of your father's tomb and where to build it. On the hill, Odysseus says again. Menelaus nods, a fitting place for them. Them? There is a slight pause. Your father and his companion, Patroclus. And why should this man be buried beside Aristos Achaion? The air is thick. They are all waiting to hear Menelaus' answer. It was your father's wish, Prince Neoptolemus, that their ashes be placed together. Pyrrhus lifts his sharp chin. A slave has no place in his master's tomb. I will not allow my father's fame to be diminished. Do not leave me here without him. Very well, Agamemnon says. It shall be as you say. I am heir and thought and can do nothing. The stone the Greeks quarry for his grave is huge and white. Achilles, it reads. That night Pyrrhus sends for Briseis. The guards hold her arms as they walk her to the tent. She kneels. My lord, my father broke with the army for you. You must have been a good bed slave. Briseis's eyes are at their darkest. My lord, I do not believe it was for me that he refused to fight. Why then, were you not his bed slave? My lord, I was never so fortunate. She hesitates. Have you heard of the man that is buried with your father? He is no one. Yet your father loved him well. He had no need of me. Silence! The word cracks over her like a lash. He stands. Come here. I cannot see where the blade comes from. It is in her hand, but he is quick, twisting away. Briseis erupts from the tent, down the beach, into the sea. Pyrrhus calmly takes a spear. She is past the breakers now. The spear flies, soundless. Its point hits her back. The black gulp of water swallows her whole. The prophecy told truly. Now that Pyrrhus has come, Troy falls. The bones of the city are cracked and sucked dry. The Greek kings stuff their holds with its gold columns and princesses. Do not leave, I beg them. 
not until you have given me peace. I curl myself around the stone obelisk of his tomb. He is gone to the underworld, and I am here. The sun is setting over the sea, spilling its colours on the water's surface. Thetis is beside me, silent in the creeping dusk. Every day she comes. She sits at the tomb's base. Let the stories of him be something more. What more? she says. For once I am not afraid. Returning Hector's body, I say. His skill with the lyre. His beautiful voice. Her mouth tightens. Have you no more memories? I am made of memories. Speak then. The memories well up like spring water. This, I say, this and this. The way his hair looked in summer sun. His face when he ran. She closes her eyes. She listens. And she too remembers. I could not make him a god, she says. But you made him. She does not answer me for a long time only sits with the last of the dying light. I have done it, she says finally. At first I do not understand, but then I see the tomb and the marks she has made. Achilles, it reads, and beside it, Patroclus. Go, she says. He waits for you. In the darkness, Two shadows reaching through the hopeless, heavy dusk. Their hands meet and light spills in a flood like a hundred golden urns pouring out the sun. <laughs>